Uh, what's up, nerds? How you doing? Uh, I chose this spot uh, because there are less of you here and you're less frightening right now. <laughs> um, my name is Mark Bennett. I'm here to talk about human trust and the continuous deployment, delivery, whatever pipeline. Uh, but first and most importantly, I am half polar bear, uh, genetically. Uh, my ideal temperature is about 50 degrees chillier than where I'm standing at this podium right now. Uh, I currently do not own a coat that I fit into, and I was born in Canada. Uh, so that's, that's all the proof I've got. Oh, and these are some gifts of me that I found on the internet, so that makes total sense. First off, who is Craftsy? Craftsy is who I work for, uh, in case no one read the title card, and that's totally okay if you didn't. Uh, they're based in Denver, Colorado. They're built on learning uh, and creating online. Uh, there's about 200 employees at the moment, uh, and we create videos uh, that teach people how to do sewing, knitting, painting, woodworking, cooking, uh, taught by extra experts in their field, uh, and uh, some interaction in there with, with the, the expert as well. We also sell supplies uh, for various categories. Uh, we have our own fulfillment center out in, Indi out in Indianapolis uh, that takes care of that. Uh, all of our website infrastructure is in AWS, uh, and we rolled out Craftsy 2.0, which is the non-monolith version of Craftsy, uh, about six months ago uh, on October 1st, 2016. Uh, we now deploy 20 to 30 times a week. Uh, I say that up front just because I want a little bit of street cred, uh, and that's about it. Uh, so first, let's talk uh, a little bit about what I, what I envisioned for this talk. Uh, when I first considered it, I came up with this following theme. Uh, trust in CI, CD systems and the team supporting them should be cultivated early and maintained through blameless transparency. Um, this theme came from my own personal experience uh, over this, uh, this Crafty 2.0 uh, experience. Uh, first, let's talk a little bit about trust. Uh, not a natural, it's not really a natural thing to think about trust on a scale of one to 10. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna leave that playing on a loop, so if you wanna keep laughing, that'd be great. Uh, you, can't, you can't put scale on a, tr on a, a trust on a scale of one to 10, it's, it's kind of binary. Uh, it scales in terms of what we trust, uh, not how much we trust it. Uh, it's, it's, if we're relating this to a bunch of nerds, I could say, that trust scales vertically and not horizontally. Uh, for example, uh, how many bread knives do I trust my toddler with? That's not a question, right? It's do I trust my toddler with a bread knife? And the answer is no. No, I really don't. <laughs> um, I feel that maybe the purpose of the DevOps movement is so that we all trust each other with our respective bread knives. Um, and that's, that's kind of what this talk is based on. All right, so we've talked about trust. Uh, let's establish uh, about what we, what we need trust in. Um, thinking about the last year and a half, I came up with kind of two different divisions of trust. The first, uh-oh, speaker notes. Oh yeah, okay. The first is trust in systems. Uh, it's trust in uh, these, these systems that we, we build to, to deploy apps, to test apps, uh, to test uh, all our different systems. The next uh, is trust in other people. Uh, and this one is definitely the hardest one to attain, uh, and probably the scariest. Um, and I don't put them in that order for any specific reason, I just had to put them in some order. Uh, I'm OCD a little bit. So I'm gonna talk about these back and forth as I trace Craftsy 2.0 timeline uh, as I saw it uh, as a newly hired DevOps engineer. Um, some of these situations we're gonna talk about were, were manufactured, they were on purpose, uh, and some of them happened by accident. Uh, but the things I talk about today could be planned uh, and maybe used again uh, in, my, in my future career. Uh, P.S., they gave me a 50 megabyte file limit on my presentation. Uh, I took that offense personally, <laughs> so I, I, uh, I have a lot of gifts. Uh, hashtag not my file size, so my bad. Uh, so story time. Uh, I started work at Craftsy uh, in November 2015, uh, about 11 months before Craftsy 2.0 was slated to be launched. Uh, back then, Craftsy was a giant Tomcat monolith uh, with one giant Postgres database uh, backing it up. Uh, and it was a sight to behold. Uh, the fact that it stayed up uh, for any amount of time at all was pretty impressive. <laughs> um, one of the first things I learned was how to deploy this giant. Uh, and that process looked something like this. 
Uh, and you can't read all those boxes, and that's on purpose. But uh, each one of those boxes represents uh, a manual step or decision uh, to roll back in the manual deployment process of our app. Uh, what we would typically do is we would all get in a, in a small room. Uh, there would be a member of ops. There'd be uh, QA, platform team, Java, Java developers there, front end team, uh, and uh, typically some form of leadership there. Uh, and one requisite of this room was that it had no climate control, I'm pretty sure. Um, I felt like that was pretty crucial for manually deploying a, a monolith. There's no climate control whatsoever. Um, so actually, in fact, the man who watched me like a hawk when I went through this for the first time is sitting right there, Matthew Beckman. Uh, and it's kind of ironic that this is my first DevOps Day talk, and again, he is sitting right there watching me like a hawk. <laughs> um, so we did everything on a Wednesday afternoon. We would start at 2, usually took 2 to 3 hours to go through. Uh, we would roll slowly new wars to servers, then we'd bounce those servers and watch them come back up and watch traffic kind of ebb and flow to the new ones. Uh, and watch for anything going wrong. Uh, we would watch tail logs. Uh, QA would be there actively testing. Uh, DBAs would be there doing any schema changes that needed to go on during the deploy. Uh, and it was, it was grueling. Uh, this made for very slow release um, schedules. Uh, when we started doing Crafty 2.0, we scaled, scaled this back to one release every two weeks, uh, which was made for a very slow progress on 1.0. Uh, so Crafty 2.0, uh, by the time I got uh, up and running at Crafty, uh, the general architecture was thought out of Crafty 2.0. We really liked microservices. Uh, our application broke down great into little services like checkout and catalog, things like that, uh, that could have their own databases. Um, but nothing was really uh, built yet. Um, right before I got there, the ops team had been swamped uh, with getting this nasty monolith ready for Black Friday, which is our biggest sale day, everyone's biggest sale day. Uh, we didn't want it to fall over, so there was a lot of prep work to be done there. Uh, so the decision was made to let the platform team, the Java engineers, uh, plan out and execute their own infrastructure uh, while consulting with the ops team. Uh, I thought this was a great idea. I thought this would lead to openness, uh, it would lead to uh, converged infrastructure uh, that we could all agree on, and they would kind of own the whole system. Uh, something interesting happened. Uh, due to uh, a couple factors, one being uh, leadership that felt like they should own everything and talk to no one, um, this platform team, uh, after two months of being there, I still had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what their infrastructure looked like. Uh, I didn't know how they were planning on load balancing, how they were planning on deploying. I didn't know any of it. Uh, despite having met with uh, the platform team leader a couple times uh, to try and talk about that. Um, so there's very little trust uh, between the ops team, on a, even on a personal level. Uh, and instead of knocking down the silos with this plan, it, we did something more like this. Um, the silos stayed up. <laughs> we tried. It didn't work. So what went wrong? Uh, turns out we didn't break down the barriers between ops and devs. We just made the developers silo different. Uh, we gave them a bigger knife. <laughs> That's all we did. Uh, we didn't trust any, each other anymore. We just distrusted each other about different things now. Um, so how do we go about and fix this trust gap? Uh, well, the first thing that happened was there was a leadership change on the platform team. Uh, that one was pretty obvious. Um, this is something that I had no control over, uh, but thankfully the, my superiors uh, saw the need for this uh, and they made the change quickly. Uh, second is that we started having a weekly site reliability engineering meeting. And before you groan about another meeting, let me tell you what it was all about. Um, this meeting worked for a couple specific reasons. Uh, the purpose of this meeting was very, very clear. Uh, we needed to keep everyone up to date with infrastructure changes, and we needed to talk about postmortems in a blameless fashion. Uh, that, was, that was all we did, basically, in these meetings. Uh, action items were kept and followed up on. Um, we had a shared document that we could all look at and see the action items from the week before, and we had someone designated to take notes and to, to remind us of those action items. Uh, and third, we had the right people in the room. Uh, we had the entire ops team. Uh, we had the better part of the platform team, most of the Java engineers. 
We had a DBA, a lead front end engineer, uh, a QA team, half the QA team was in there. Uh, and these typically ranged from about half an hour to an hour long. They weren't terribly long. Uh, but this worked really well for us. Um, this put us all on the same page. This forced us to talk about the issues that were plaguing our overall infrastructure um, and talked about, made us talk about them together. Um, the blameless postmortems thing, one key that we started out with was not saying names. Uh, we wouldn't say, hey, this person did this thing. We said a ops engineer uh, pushed the wrong git commit to prod and it all broke. Um, how can we avoid that? Uh, and that, that second part of the conversation, the how can we avoid this again, uh, is what really proved to be valuable in these meetings. Uh, in my mind, looking back, the thing that transitioned us to a culture of trust uh, were those postmortems. Um, this time uh, and communication were, were kind of key. We, we started doing these in January, uh, and we were going to launch in October. Um, and it took a good couple months for us to start trusting each other. Um, we finally started communicating outside of this meeting <laughs> on a regular basis, which was novel. Uh, but it created an organizational um, goal to keep the site running, which seems like it should be obvious, but it wasn't or something. So what did we do? We started building this continuous deployment pipeline. Um, so I'm going to talk about trust in systems a little bit now. I mentioned before that we shipped a code, uh, production of code 20 to 30 times a week. That probably leads you to believe that we're a continuous deployment shop. Uh, that's kind of a lie. It's a little bit false. Uh, and that's OK. Uh, I've invented a new word to describe what we do. I've looked this up. It's not really on Google. It's called the continuous deployment <laughs> pipeline. Uh, that's right. Continuous. Uh, Craftsy, Craftsy had been doing manual deploys for a long time. Uh, and for five plus years. Uh, and that level of manual intervention uh, is a form of addiction. <laughs> uh, it's something that you have to work to get over. Uh, so fast forward in our timeline a little bit. It's now the beginning of June 2016. Uh, we've got, we just launched our own fulfillment center in Indianapolis because rewriting our entire website wasn't enough for one year. Uh, and we have most of the microservices up and running. We've got a continuous deployment pipeline mostly working. Um, and we've seen enough of these, oh, functional tests missed that because of this, uh, that we really didn't trust the automated tests that we had. Um, so we had, a, a, we had a call to make. Uh, it was late enough in the project that we were in full swing building features out. Uh, we didn't want to slow that down. Uh, but we needed a, a stable place to load test, uh, to do UX, UI testing. Um, we, needed, we needed somewhere stable. Um, so we put a gateway between stage and prod. Uh, it's a single button push. Uh, it's a one promotion in Jenkins uh, that allows a developer or me or anyone on the team to go and promote that certain microservice uh, into production. Uh, this proved to be really cool. Um, this is actually one of the coolest things I've seen at Craftsy because we had a, a front end engineer join the team last week, uh, last Wednesday. And they came in, they got their computer, they got all set up. In the afternoon, they were writing code. And before the day was done, they had pushed something to prod on their first day of work. Um, and that was a really cool, really empowering thing to see them do. Uh, it includes them in the, in the pipeline process a little more, in the, in the deployment process, uh, even if it's just to push a button, saying, yes, I put my stamp of approval on this. I worked on it. It's been tested. QA knows about it. It's going to production now. Um, so uh, obviously with this um, style, uh, there's bound to be the case where we write something, it gets put on stage, and then it just sits there uh, forever because it doesn't automatically go to prod. Uh, so this is where uh, trust in the system came in a little bit more uh, with a, a, a system that I wrote. Uh, and I called him Trogdor the Continuous Deployment Sheriff. Uh, and this little guy, he runs in our hip chat server uh, and he bugs the developers whenever it's time to push to prod again. Whenever something's been sitting in stage for more than 12 hours that passes functional tests, why is it still in stage? It'll do this every day at 10 and 4. And it's really annoying because it actually like rings you and notifies you and 
people hate him, but he works. <laughs> um, so, like I said, that, that, um, this time between trusting a system when you first stand it up and when you, when you actually deploy it to prod uh, is something that, that does take time. Um, we're still on this system. We're still not fully continuously deploying. Uh, I'm not sure that we ever will be for some systems. There are some systems that are uh, manual enough um, that actually, for some PCI requirements, require us to have a manual button push there. Um, but that's okay, because we're building trust in our own system this way, uh, and in the end, we're going to get there. Uh, our systems, above all, that we're building should be transparent. Um, this is programming 101, but when something goes wrong, you should know about it. Only in infrastructure when this happens, when your pipeline fails, uh, it's almost more important uh, than when it runs normal. Uh, we should know exactly what happened and exactly what fails. And this is, this is the communication of the system aspect uh, of our continuous deployment uh, services. Uh, so you, right now you're thinking, so what? Why are you still talking, Bennett? You've told your story. Get off the stage. It's time for lunch. Uh, my point here is this. Uh, when you go about planning a project, make sure there is an allotted time for these processes to happen, uh, for this trust to build. Um, you can build it into um, many different areas of your project, um, but for, for me, um, another story quick, actually. Uh, just this year, we had, so this whole time we've been running on a load balancer, a layer seven load balancer, uh, whose company I will not name, but they were very expensive and very big, and it was a little redundant. Um, I came up with a plan. I pitched this plan to uh, my manager and said, hey, we can replace these with uh, AWS's new application load balancers. Uh, we can take these out. Uh, it'll run the same speed, if not better. It'll be more redundant, and it'll cost uh, a tenth of the cost. He thought that was a great idea. Uh, so I built out this project plan. I said, okay, the first uh, half of this is gonna be getting this into stage and getting it staged in prod. Uh, and then the second half is just going to be testing uh, and transitioning. Um, and I did that because this was a fundamental part of our stack. This was underlying everything that we would built in Craftsy 2.0. Um, and uh, it enabled me to do serious load testing uh, on this project, on the load balancer, uh, and prove with numbers to not only me, not only to my manager, but to the execs on our, on, in our company uh, that this was a good move for us and this was going to go seamlessly. Uh, that trust had to be built manually. They trusted me. They didn't trust my system yet. Uh, and that needed to, to be built out in, in my project plan. Um, so there's one more part of the CICD trust that I have yet to talk about, and that is launch day. Uh, so imagine we're about halfway through the summer. We've got the system in place. People are starting to trust the system. People are trusting the alerting system we have in place. Uh, and somewhere in the middle of summer, I don't remember the exact day, we decided that October 1st was going to be the day that we launched Craftsy 2.0. It was a hard cutover from Craftsy 1.0. Everything was going to change on that day. Uh, and the day that that was announced, there was an interesting, uh, was an interesting dynamic that entered the team. Uh, things got a little more tense because we were going to production and this was actually real. Uh, and there was a little bit of distrust that entered, that entered the team. Uh, thankfully, due to these regular SRE meetings, we had this framework in place uh, where we could come together and we could discuss these serious failures that were happening two weeks before we were supposed to launch and figure out how to fix them in a blameless manner. Uh, without this, uh, I, I'm quite confident we would have torn each other apart. Uh, between the dev team, the ops team, and QA, none of us would have survived. <laughs> um, so a week before, a month before launch, the ops team stopped uh, any build, building of new systems. Uh, any deployment systems, we, we totally froze all together. Um, this was to allow us to load test, uh, to continue to, to build our monitoring solution, uh, and to, to, to just watch this thing for a month. Uh, one week before the launch date, the uh, platform team, the, the devs, completely code froze as well. Uh, there was nothing that was going to be released. Everything was on hold uh, so that we could load test and that we could finally gain that last little bit of trust we needed in this system to push it out. Um, we had already built the trust in each other. It was now trust in the system that we needed to, to get out there. Uh, a, the launch day came. Uh, we flipped the giant switch. Uh, the new site went up, uh, and then we waited. 
Uh, and it was, it was the most tense thing I've ever, I've ever seen, um, waiting in this room, watching people hit our new site and just waiting for the errors to come in. Uh, we didn't have anything planned for a week. We weren't going to deploy anything for a week. We were just going to watch it. Um, but uh, within about an hour, a bug came up that we needed to fix uh, right away. Um, and so an hour after launching this new website, we were now deploying an entirely new front end uh, to, uh, our, to production. Uh, and this scared us all. Um, but we were able to do it because of this trust we'd built in our system before. We'd watched this deploy pipeline hundreds of times. Uh, we'd, we'd monitored it. We knew that people weren't going to lose any connections. Uh, and so we went ahead and we pushed. Uh, we pushed the launch three hours after, pushed the production three hours after launching this brand new website. Um, and it went perfect. It went off without a hitch. Uh, and thank goodness. Um, if it hadn't, I don't know what we would have done. Uh, because at that moment, all of a sudden, the executive team was addicted to continuous deployment. Uh, they saw the power in being able to push a button and deploy a bug fix three hours after launch to production. Um, and they trusted the system after that. Um, it was just up to us to, to maintain that trust and maintain that system. Um, so finally, uh, back to the beginning, uh, trust in the CICD systems and the team supporting them should be cultivated early and maintained through transparency. Uh, by doing this, we plan for, sorry, by doing this, uh, by planning for this trust, uh, it will come. This trust, it doesn't just fall in your lap. Uh, you have to plan for it. It doesn't just happen because you think, oh, give it time. It, you have to have transparency. You have to have good communication. Um, I've given a couple ideas on how to do this, uh, but ultimately it comes down to transparency and time. Uh, those are the two basic ingredients to, to building trust in your CI CD systems. Uh, and thank you so much for your time and attention. And uh, are there any questions? Oh, it's round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, so he asked if there was ever like a, a point where we, at that you know, hour after launch, uh, there's a bug in production. Do we roll back to the old version? Um, that decision was made months before uh, that we were not going to roll back, that this was actually happening. Uh, the process was in place to build and to push and to, to, to push that bug fix out. Uh, there, was a, there was a call made, not a non-organic one, uh, about a week before uh, saying, hey, this is actually happening. <laughs> uh, we are not rolling back. Uh, and, then, and then again, even, even as we got closer, an hour before even launch, uh, there was a green light saying, yes, our system is good. We're rolling with this. Um, the rollback was never really a plan uh, in, that, in that launch, no. Some of the guides. Yes. So he asked, uh, he asked what were some of the guides that helped, me, helped, helped us along our journey? Uh, honestly, the man sitting over there, Matthew Beckman, he was a huge, huge help. Uh, he knows a lot about, uh, a lot about organizational structure and, and keeping teams on track. Uh, we have an excellent exec team. Uh, that also pays very close attention to how we're organized uh, and how things uh, play out. Our CTO, Todd Tobin, he, he's fantastic uh, about, about getting us to communicate with each other in a meaningful way. Um, there, there's a lot of attention paid to that. Uh, even, even as far as where we sit in the office, um, is paid attention to just so we can communicate on a better level. Uh, and I think that pays a lot of homage to, to how we launched 2.0. Can we please get a stuffed polar bear for next year? That I will look into that meme. We'll see what we can work in for next year. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, great shirt. Uh, do we release database changes in the same cadence that we release uh, code changes? Uh, yes. Uh, each release uh, to a production service has uh, a set of schema changes that goes along with it. Uh, typically, what we do is we deploy a, a canary out there to make sure nothing's crazy wrong with it. Uh, and then we roll forward with schema changes and then uh, the rest of the deploy. Yes, how do we deal with interdependency issues with, between our microservices and deploy ordering? Uh, that's a really great question. A lot, of, a lot of attention was paid to that early on in this process. Uh, we, we made a constraint that no microservice could talk directly to another microservice. Uh, that was huge for us. Uh, it all had to run through one common API gateway for these, these microservices. 
Uh, so typically, the only dependency you usually ever have is there's some API endpoints on an API gateway you have to push out first, uh, and then you can release your, your app. Does that make sense? All right, I'm okay. out. <laughs>